Getting in the zone. Getting in the zone. So what do we mean by that? Inshallah, I'm going to go through 11 points that we need to do to help develop our khushu, the things that we should recognize and know. And again, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned at the beginning of the course, if you want to benefit from this course, you need to take notes. Because you're going to learn this, your iman is going to increase, you're going to feel, man, salah is awesome. But when it comes two days later or a week later, you're not going to remember it. So you need to take notes. So I strongly encourage everyone, take out, if you don't have pen, pen and paper, take out your cell phone, take out your iPad, whatever. Take notes, please, for your own benefit, inshallah ta'ala. Number one, getting in the zone. How do we get, so we've, made, we've heard the adhan, we've heard the call to prayer. We love hearing this call. We're affected by this call. We make wudu, we think about all these things. Now we come and we get ready to pray. How do we have khushu' before we start salah? Number one, and by the way, actually, before I tell you number one, Ali Nabi Talib says that when the time for prayer came, the Hadrat al Salah, yatazalzal wa yatalawan wajha. That wajhu, that when he, when the time for prayer came, he would literally shake and his, this, the color of his face would change. Why? He says, Ja'a wallahi waqtu al amana, urida aradaha Allahu ala samawati wal ardu wal jibal, fa abayna ay yahmilaha wa shfaqna minha wa hamaltuha ana. He says, the time for a trust has come. That the skies and the earth and the mountains refuse to take on. But I took it on. As salah. He equated the religion of Allah to as salah. We talked about yesterday the importance of prayer. You understand how they looked at the view of salah. Salah is the deen. So he would get scared. He's like, this is an amana. Am I gonna fulfill it properly or not? So number one, the most basic is think about what you are doing. Think about what you are doing. What do I mean by that? Brothers and sisters, when you stand before Allah, to, you are worshipping Allah. Do you understand what worship means? You are submitting yourself fully to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You make ruku'ah, you, you humble yourself to Allah. You take out time from whatever it is you are doing. Whether you're even in the surgery room, whether you're in the ER, whether you're in school, even subhanAllah, the thing about salah is no matter what position you're in, you have to pray. Even if you are so weak, you can only pray with your eyes, it is required of you to pray with your eyes. I remember I, in medical school, I was in the OR. What happened was there, there was an emergency case came in. And uh, the doctor, there was only one doctor. All the other residents and everything, they're busy. So the doctor needed a, a, a hand to help him out. To, to help with the surgery. So I was on anesthesia. And they said, okay, you got to scrub in and help out in the case. I said, okay, but I had to pray dhuhr. I was going to go out during that case and go pray dhuhr. And the case was a long case. So I was scrubbed in. And so I had to pray with, with my eyes, with my face. I'm standing in the survey room and I had to pray with my face. Because there is no excuse for the one who the salah comes in and they don't pray. No excuse. Amr al-Khattab, we talked about him yesterday in the khutbah. He was about to die. His intestines were hanging out of his stomach. He still prayed salat al-fajr. There's no excuse. So think about what you're doing, that you're submitting yourself to Allah. You're praising Him. You're thanking Him for all the blessings He's given you. How He's covered our sins. And even though we use the blessings He's given us to sin against Him, He still continues to give us blessings. We think about what we are doing. Number two, minimize distractions. It's a basic point, but again, it's important. For example, somebody has to use the bathroom. He's really got to go. But he doesn't want to have to make wudu again. Now, inshallah, after we just talked about wudu, I think everybody wants to make wudu because of the reward in wudu. But let's say he doesn't want to make wudu again, so he prays Salat al Maghrib, but he has to go to the bathroom. So his mind's on going to the bathroom while he's praying. Prophet said, No, use the bathroom first, then come to pray. He says, I said, Al Asha, Qabl al Isha, dinner before Salat al Isha. Meaning, if you're hungry and the time for prayer is there, the food is served, don't pray first. Because your mind is going to be on the biryani while your body's in front of Allah. So eat first, as long as of course there's time for prayer, it's not the end of prayer, there's time for prayer. Eat first if you're hungry, this food is served, eat first, then pray. Minimize distractions, don't pray in a place where music is playing or the TV is on, maybe the, the, the NBA Finals is on, so the guy, he makes the TV right in the Qibla, so he's praying, he's looking at the game. Okay, it doesn't work like that, man. Minimize the distractions. Number three, going to the masjid. This helps with khushu'ah. As we mentioned earlier, that the Prophet said that the shaitan attacks the believer just like the wolf attacks the lone sheep. So go to the masjid when you're in jama'ah, you have the protection of the jama'ah. And of course for the men, this is recommended for the sisters, is you get more reward for praying at home. 
For the men, of course, it's more recommended to pray in the masjid. In fact, the scholars say if you live close enough to the masjid where you can hear the adhan, it's required to come. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, a blind sahabi, he went to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am blind. Do I have an excuse to not come to the prayer? The Prophet said, you have an excuse. Then he called him back. He said, do you hear the adhan? He says, yes, I hear the adhan. Then he says, then come based on listening. You're, you're blind, but you can hear. So come based on your, your hearing to the prayer. This is a blind man. What about us? We live especially here in the city, mashallah, we have the homes and the apartments and the, the townhomes right next to the masjid. It's fard. It's required if you live close to the masjid to attend the masjid for salah. If you live further away, then it's recommended to the best of your ability. So now, when you go to the masjid, there's many sub points under this point. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim that every step, he says, he says, "Man fi thumma ila min Whoever makes wudu in his home, then he walks to a house from the houses of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, liyqdiya faridatan min faraidillah to to pray one of the fard prayers. He ﷺ says, "Kanat khatat." He says, Sallallahu Wasallam, that for the one who makes wudu in his home and goes to pray fard in the masjid, every step he takes, one step is a sin forgiven, and the other step is a rank raised. So now, brothers and sisters, when you're walking to the masjid, and especially here, you have the blessing of walking to the masjid. Walk to the masjid. Every step you take is a sin forgiven and a rank raised. Can you imagine? And if you're driving, Allah Alam, what the reward is? Maybe every time the wheel turns, every time, every foot, Allah Alam, what it is? Allah is merciful, we don't have to count the mercy of Allah. Allah is going to be merciful with us and generous with us. He said, Kareem. But imagine the reward. Every step is a sin forgiven, and another step is a rank raised. Now, what if you're late for salah? Especially if the Imam's in Rukur. Right? The brothers, they run in, some people they jingle the keys, they say, yeah, Assalamu alaikum, just to tell the Imam, hey, to, to give me a second, let me catch the, let me catch the rakah. The Prophet ﷺ says in the Sahih Hadith in Ahmad Abu Dawood that when the iqamah for prayer is given, then do not run to it, but come to it with calmness. He says, then pray whatever you reach and, whatever, and make up whatever you miss. Since when one of you is proceeding to the prayer, he is in fact in prayer. Can you imagine? You leave your home walking to the masjid, and every, as soon as you leave your home, you are getting the reward as if you are in prayer. That's amazing. That's amazing. On your way to prayer, you get the reward as if you are in prayer. Not only that, well, if you come to the masjid, let's say Salat al-Asr, when the adhan is called, you make wudu and you sit in the masjid waiting for the iqamah. We said dua is answered. But not only that, you know what happens? The Prophet says, لا يزال العبد في صلاة ما كان في مصلى. Number one, ينتظر الصلاة. Number one, as we just mentioned, if you're waiting for the prayer, then you get the reward as if you are in prayer. Number two, he says, وتقول الملائكة اللهم اغفر له اللهم ارحم. The angels, as you are sitting waiting for the aqama to be given, are making dua for you. Even if you're a sinner, me, I'm a sinner, I'm a weak Muslim, I, have, I missed Salat al-Fajr today, I overslept. Even you, the angel will say, Allahumma ghfir, oh Allah, forgive him, oh Allah, have mercy on him. Can you imagine you get the dua of the angels, you're getting the reward of being in prayer every step you take. The Prophet ﷺ even said to Sahih Muslim, that if you knew the reward of praying in the first row, you would draw lots for it to come to that, to get that position. Just sometimes people when it's time for prayer, it's like Jum'ah, people get the walls, like they want to come early to get the wall. Ah, come get the first row. You know like if I told you I got tickets to the, to the, the Thunder Miami Heat game was it tomorrow or Monday or whatever, the next game, game two, I got tickets. But if I told you it's in the, up, the highest bowl on the last row, you'd be like, man, I just watched the, watch the game on HD television, I get a better view, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's cool you got tickets and all, but I ain't really feeling it. But if I told you I got tickets, front row, bro. Dallas Cowboys 50 yard line. Right in the middle. Do you want to be behind the goalpost or do you want to be at the 50 yard line? I'm at 50 yard line. You want to be right in the middle. Same thing, the analogy for salah. The most rewarded position is right behind the Imam. But it should be kept for those who have knowledge of the Quran. Because if the Imam has to leave, like Muhammad Khattab, yesterday we talked about, then the person right behind the Imam steps forward to finish the prayer. And he corrects the Imam if he makes a mistake. But come to the first row, get the reward. Why do we long for like first row for sports games, but we don't long for first row with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Come to the first row and say, Oh Allah, I came early for your sake. Imagine the reward you get. 
Now, just by the way, just, just a, 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 some, a, com- a quick comment about coming early to prayer. If you come early, my humble advice is park far. So people come early and they want to park the closest spot, right? Like even if you go to Walmart and you're shopping, especially here the super center, you know, parking is ridiculous. It's, it's kind of strange because you'll see people, let's say there's an open spot here and two spots down, there's somebody who just got there with their cart and they have to load the groceries and move the cart out. You know what people do? They wait for that one. Even though there's a spot right before it. But they want to get the closest one possible. Tell you, man, if you just parked earlier to the, fir- the one spot further, you would have been inside the store and already probably got half of your groceries by the time you even parked in the second one that's closer. But people are like, I gotta get closer. I gotta get closer. But when you come to pray, if you're early, park far. Why? Two reasons. Number one, you get more footsteps. More sins forgiven, a higher rank you're raised. Number two, for the people who, they came late. And this is, not, this is not to reward people who come late, but the people who come late, now they can park closer and get, they won't miss as much of the prayer. So it's a win-win, you win, they win. Why not? And I've seen some brothers from this community who do that. They park all the way at the end and they walk the long way in. It's awesome. It's, it's, it's banking on the edge, why not? And don't feel like, oh, I'm missing out on the, on the reward of prayer. Remember, every step you take toward the message, you're in prayer. So just an advice, even for Jama'ah, those kind of things, do, do it if you can. It's more reward for you and helps out your brothers and sisters who come late. Tayyib, number four. Know that when you are praying, you are joining the creation of Allah and worshipping Him. The Prophet said it in a, in a, in a Sayyid hadith, أَطَّتِ السَّمَاءِ وَحُقَّ لَهَا أَن تَأَلْتِ He says that the skies have let out these moans of distress and they have every right to do so. He says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ مَا فِيهَا مَوْضِعُ شِبْرُ إِلَّا وَفِيهِ جَبْهَةٌ جَبْهَةُ مَلَكٌ سَاجِدٌ يُسَبِّحُ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدٍ He says that there is no position the width of a hand's length except that there is an angel with his forehead on the ground in sajdata, not on the ground, in the sky, the ground, whatever it is to them, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when I talked about Isra and Mi'raj this morning, when we said the Prophet went through the first heaven and the second heaven and the third heaven. Do you know what that means? And by the way, when I say heaven, it doesn't mean paradise. It means sky. There's seven skies, which I'm using the term heaven, seven heavens, but it's not Jannah, it's not paradise, it's seven skies. You know what Allah says in the Quran? وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِزِينَةٍ الْكَوَاكِبِ We have indeed beautified the Sama' al-dunya with the beauty of stars. You know what that means? That means all what we know. All the stars, we, the sun is the closest star, it's 4.2 billion, not miles, 4.2 billion light years away. All the galaxies that we've discovered, all the stars that we are aware of, all of that is just from the lowest sama, sama ad dunya. And you know what the Prophet Sallallahu said comparing sama ad dunya to the second sama? He says the first sama to the second sama, the first sky to the second sky, is like the size of a ring in a desert. Can you imagine how vast the creation of Allah is? Subhanaka ya Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha baatina. And the second heaven to the third is like a ring in a desert. And the third to the fourth like a ring in a desert until the seventh. And the seventh sky compared to the kursi of Allah is like a ring in a desert. Subhanak, ma qadarnaka haqqa qadrik. We have not given Allah His due rights. This is how wide the creation of Allah is. And the Prophet when he went to Isra and Mi'raj he witnessed all of this. And he saw Jannah, and he saw hellfire, and he saw the tree and the rivers of Jannah. Beautiful sights. But the Prophet said that there is no space in all these skies, the hand of this much. Can you imagine how many angels that is? All they're making sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now when you and I pray, never feel like you're alone. You're at Walmart and you gotta pray in the in the in the Somewhere, maybe people go in the dressing room. One time I was, in, I was in Kohl's with my cousin. We had to pray, so we went to the dressing room, but we went to the wrong dressing room. <laughs> we went to the sister section. <laughs> so we were real quickly run, ran out. Wherever you are, you pray. Maybe you're at school and your friends are like, man, what you doing, man? You're at work, you gotta tell your boss, I gotta go pray. People are scared. People get caught with the foot in the, in the sink. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what people make excuses they make. Like, what are you doing? Sometimes you feel lonely as a believer in a land of disbelievers. But never feel lonely, because when you pray, you're joining what the angels, you know, imagine how many angels that is. 
70,000 angels go to Bayt al-Ma'mur and never return again every day. That's the case. There's an infinite amount of angels and they're worshipping Allah like this. So don't feel alone. Even if you're alone in this world, you're joining the ranks of the, the angels in the, in the heavens. Number five, when you pray, the earth that you pray on will be a witness for you. Think about this. Allah SWT says in Surah Al-Dukhan, about Fir'aun, when Fir'aun and his people were killed, they were destroyed by the sea. Allah says, فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَا كَانُوا مُنْظَرِينَ That the skies and the earth did not weep for them, nor were they given any respite. So a man went to Ibn Abbas, and he asked him, what does that mean? Do the, do the skies and the earth weep for someone? When Fir'aun was killed, Allah said the sky and the earth didn't cry for them. Do the skies and the earth weep for someone? Ibn Abbas, he says, yes. There is no one who does not have a gate in the heavens through which his provision comes down and his good deed ascends. When the believer dies, this gate by which the, your good deeds would ascend, he says, this gate cries for the death of this believer, missing the good deeds that used to come through it. So brothers and sisters, every one of us has a specific place in the heavens where there is a gate by which our good deeds ascend to Allah. Now what do we send through that gate? You see, just like we all have a reputation in this world, this person is a doctor, this person is an engineer, this person is a student of knowledge, this person is, is uh, the president of the masjid, this person is uh, a teacher, this person, whatever, everybody has a reputation. This person is good, this person is kind, this person is funny. We all have reputations in the heavens. All of us have reputation in the skies. Now, the believer is one who doesn't care for his reputation in this world, but rather, he cares for his reputation with Allah and the angels. So when you, every time you do a good deed, your deeds ascend through this gate, and when you die, this gate weeps for the person, uh, missing him in the good deeds. And he, he, Ibn Abbas, he says, and the place of prayer on earth, where he used to pray and remember Allah, also weeps for him. Now think about this, brothers and sisters. Next time you stand before Allah, you're sitting in this masjid, when you stand at this point right here in the masjid, this piece of land is going to witness for you on the day of judgment. When you're in your home and you're praying the sunnah and the sisters are praying the farad, or if you live far away, you're praying the farad at home, that piece of land in your home is going to witness for you on the day of judgment. Oh Allah, Sumayya, Fatima, Aisha, Ibrahim, Abdullah, Muhammad, these people you used to worship Allah on me. Now ask yourself this what kind of testimony will the earth give about our prayer? You prayed a good prayer or you prayed a lazy prayer? You prayed a prayer full of humility to you, O Allah, or you prayed a prayer full of, of negligence and, and laziness? So now when you pray and you're thinking, Ya Allah, this piece of land is going to witness for me. You know the poet, he says, See, those who cry for Rahman, they cry in the night, and they spend the night in, with their tears, and they never get bored. And he says, The corners of the earth long for these people. And they let out almost this like, sigh of relief and comfort when these believers make sajda on top of the earth. So now when we pray, brothers and sisters, Think about that. That where you're praying is the witness for you and what, whatever good deeds you do ascend to the heavens through this gate. Number six. Now this is a weak hadith. This is a weak hadith in, recorded in Tabarani. Again, if I share a hadith through this week, I will tell you it's weak. But just to share so you know, subhanAllah, it's a beautiful hadith. Prophet says in, in, in this hadith, إِذَا تَوَضَّأَ الْعَبْدُ فَأَحْسَنْ وُضُوءَهُ ثُمَّ قَامَ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَأَتَمَّ رُكُوعَهَا وَسُجُودَهَا وَالْقِرَاءَةَ فِيهَا قَالَتْ لَهُ الصَّلَاةِ حَفِذَكَ اللَّهِ كَمَا حَفَظْتَنِي when the believer stands to pray, he makes wudu good. He does a good job with his wudu. We talked about that. And he prays and he does a good job with ruku' and sujood, meaning he does a good job in his prayer. Salah will tell this person, حَفِذَكَ Allah كَمَا حَفَظْتَنِي May Allah preserve you just like you have preserved me. 
Not only that. The hadith continues. He says, ثُمَّ أَصْعَدَ بِهَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ لَهَا ضَوْءٌ وَنُورٌ وَفُتِحَتْ لَهَا أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ حَتَّى يَنْتَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَتَشْفَعُ لِصَاحِبِهَا He says, then this salah will be raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until it reaches Allah. And it, the hadith says it has a light and a nur shining from the salah as it's going up to Allah and it will intercede on the one who prayed it this prayer. Imagine your salah goes up to Allah and say, Oh Allah, this slave of yours has prayed a prayer in which he honored me and he preserved the rights of me. So Allah, preserve him. Preserve her. Ya Allah. So now when you think about this and you recognize this, when you're about to pray and stand before Allah, you're going to pray with khushu and concentration. Number seven. And by the way, this hadith continues. Let me just finish that. The Prophet says, وَإِذَا طَيْعَ وُضُوءَهَا وَرُكُوعَهَا وَسُجُودَهَا وَالْقِرَاءَةَ فِيهَا And if they don't do a good job and it's wudu and it's ruku' and it's sujood, the, the salah will tell the person, ضَيَّعَكَ اللَّهُ كَمَا ضَيَّعْتَنِي You know, may you, may you like be lost just like you lost me. And then it will go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ثُمَّ أَصْعَدَ بِهَا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَعَلَيْهَا ظُلْمَةٌ فَغُلِّقَتْ دُونَهَا it will go up to the skies, but it will have this darkness. The good salah will have this light. This salah will have darkness, and, this, and it will be closed everything around. It won't even be able to ascend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, number seven. The next point, pray as if this is your last prayer. The Prophet said in a Sahih hadith, إِذَا قُمْتَ فِي صَلَاتِكْ فَصَلِّ صَلَاةَ مُوَدِّعْ He said, when you stand to pray, pray as if you are praying the prayer of someone who is bidding farewell. Imagine, brothers and sisters, if you knew that the prayer you're going to make is your last prayer. If you knew when you leave today, لا سمح الله, you're getting in a car accident and you're going to die. Will you care that, you're, you're, that you have to go back and you have homework you have to finish? Or that the, you have to finish cooking? Or you have to go back to the basketball game? Or you have to go watch the TV show? Or whatever it is that people keep themselves busy with? Would you care? Even important things, would you care? If this is the last prayer you're ever going to make in your life, but the Prophet advised us, when you pray, think about that, that, Ya Allah, this is my last prayer I'm ever going to make. You will pray completely differently. Versus thinking, oh, I'm just, it's a task I got to take care of. It's not a gift from Allah, it's a task. Allahu Akbar, Allah Sameen, Alhamdulillah, just, and with full laziness. This is your last prayer. How many people, brothers and sisters, how many millions of people have died? How many Muslims have died? Expecting to make it to the next prayer, but they never made it. How many millions, billions? So pray as if it's your last prayer. Number eight, know that you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what's interesting is when in Ramadan, when Ramadan comes, when is the time people cry in salah the most? When do people cry in salah the most? The dua part. Did you notice that? They don't cry in salah, or most people don't, or in ruku' or sujood. When do they cry when the imam is making dua in witr and qunud? Right? That's when people cry. Why? Have you thought about that? In the end of tarawih, right? Was, but why do people cry though when, when the dua is being made, but not when the recitation is being made? The same last rak'ah, or when the last sujood is being made. Why don't they cry then? Because you know when, when you're making dua to Allah, you feel like you feel like you are talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You feel like you're talking to Allah, that Allah is listening to you. You're asking Him for help, you're asking Him for, for whatever it is you're asking Him for. And when you understand that you're talking to Allah, you feel this connection that you don't feel in other parts of prayer. And then you're like, oh Allah above the seven heavens, above the arsh, He is listening to me, I am talking to Him. I, me, the insignificant slave, the sinner, have an audience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just that realization causes tears to fall. But the Prophet said in Sahih Hadith, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ إِذَا قَامَ يُصَلِّ إِنَّمَا يُنَاجِي رَبَّهِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ كَيْفَ يُنَاجِهِ he said, when any one of you stand to pray, know that he is talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and confiding in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let everyone look to how he is talking to Allah. You know, if I told you, if Dirk Nowitzki called you right now, Dallas hero, right? We all, we all love Dirk Nowitzki. He calls you and he's like, and he, imagine you pick up and you're like, yeah, this is Dirk. 
or he has a German accent, right? I don't know how he talks. Imagine he's talking, you're like, bro, bro, Dirk Nowitzki? Are you kidding me? Right away you tweet, hey, guess who I talked to today? You post on, you call your friend, like, hey, you know, you know, you know who called me today? Dirk Nowitzki, man. You call him two minutes later, hey, by the way, you remember what happened two minutes ago? You know who called me today? You'll be like ecstatic, be like, bro, I am the man, dude. I mean, I got superstars calling me. Even when, you know, when you're sitting in a lecture or something with a sheikh, you know, and the sheikh calls you out by name. Imagine you're at, like, it's the convention and, like, Sheikh Yasser Qadi is giving you a talk and he's like, I want to give a shout out to my boy Salman. He's just the man. You're like, thank you, man. Among 20,000 people, he called me out. I feel special. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to you when you pray. We're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, man. You talk to Allah in every prayer. Don't, do we feel anything special when we pray? Or is it just like, oh man, I gotta pray again? It's 5 a.m. It's Salah has fajr too early. I kind of bench this 300 pound blanket off of me. I mean, man, it's just, uh, uh, I give up. I'm gonna go back to sleep. How do we, Allah is talking to us, man. You know what, we talk to Allah when we say, It is only you we worship. We say, Allah, To you is the praise. All our salah is full of talking to Allah. But we don't feel that because we don't feel that our salah becomes like empty movements. But feel like you're talking to Allah. Not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your name. Maybe this analogy fits better here. When you get when a, a famous person calls you out by name, you're like, wow, this person mentioned me. Allah mentions you when you pray. Allah subhanahu says in the Quran, Allah says, and recite what we have revealed to you from the book, the Quran, and establish the prayer, for certainly prayer stops you from evil and wicked deeds. Then he says, وَلَا ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And the remembrance of Allah is greater, and Allah knows what you do. Now what does that mean, the remembrance of Allah is greater? Those of you here in the beginning, in the morning session, what is the purpose of prayer? You guys still awake? وَأَقِيمِ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِكْرِ Establish a prayer to remember Allah. So the ayah says, and the remembrance of Allah is greater. So Ibn Abbas, he asks, he asks, a man, Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah, he says, what does this mean? Wala dhikrullahi akbar. And the remembrance of Allah is greater. What does that mean? So the man said, dhikrullahi bit tasbihi wa tahnili wa tahmeed. When we pray, we, we, we say subhanallah, we say alhamdulillah, we say la ilaha illallah, we're remembering Allah. So this is what it means. The remembrance of Allah is an important part of the prayer. That you remember Allah and you don't pray with a negligent mind. Ibn Abbas, he says, no. You know what he says? And the remembrance of Allah is greater. He says, "La ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ إِيَّاكُمْ أَكْبَرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِكُمْ إِيَّاهُ How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers you is greater than your remembrance of Allah. And he, remember, he mentioned the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرُكُمْ Remember me and I will remember you. So when you stand before Allah and you're remembering Allah, Imagine, brothers and sisters, Allah is mentioning you by name. Yeah, about me, me. Who am I? What, what has given me the right to be mentioned by Allah? Can you imagine Ubay ibn Ka'ab? The Prophet went to him and he said, Allah has commanded to me, commanded me to recite to you Surah Al Bayyinah. So imagine the Prophet comes to you and he says to you, Allah has told me to recite to you Surah al bayyinah What would you, what would you, what would you feel? Like, wow, man. You know, Ubay asked the Prophet, so I said, he had one question. He said, was Samani? Did Allah, my creed, did Allah mention my name? He mentioned me. And he a slave from the slaves of Allah. He mentioned my name. And the Prophet said, yes. He told me to recite to you by name. When Ubay heard that, he just broke down crying. Yeah, Allah mentioned my name, me. Who, who am I? And when we pray to Allah and remember Allah, Allah mentions us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you understand what that means? Allah mentions us by name. 
Ya Allah, next time you pray now and you're sitting there before the iqamah, you're getting ready, you're like, I am about to stand before my Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and He's going to remember me. He's going to mention my name. How will your concentration change? Not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet says in a hadith sahih, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَمَرَكُمْ بِالصَّلَاةِ فَإِذَا صَلَّيْتُمْ فَلَا تَلْتَفِتُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَنْصِبُ وَجْهَهُ لِوَجْهِ عَبْدِهِ فِي صَلَاتِهِ مَا لَمْ يَلْتَفِتْ Number 10, the Prophet said in a hadith sahih, that when you stand to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at you. Allah faces you. You, even me, if I'm a sinner, even you. My iman is so weak and I, I, I do so many bad things, Allah's gonna look at me directly, me, even you. He saw him says, Allah looks at his slave when he prays so long as his slave doesn't turn away from Allah. What does that mean? Does that mean so long as you don't turn away from looking down where you're making sajda? Yes, but there's more to that. The actual asl of the meaning of the hadith, the original meaning of the hadith, is not physically looking away, it's actually turning away with the heart. So you start prayer and you're thinking about Allah, then you remember, oh man, the Mavericks game, I wonder who's going to win today. When you turn away with your heart, when you stop remembering Allah, Allah turns His face away from you. So now you have extra motivation to keep focusing on an salah. Allah is looking at you so long as you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 11. Brothers and sisters, if we understand this, if we understand that we're talking to Allah, and Allah is mentioning us by name, and the earth is going to witness for us, and our deeds are going to ascend to the heavens, and the salah is going to testify on our behalf, and if we understand that we're going to talk to Allah, and Allah is going to look at us, the question then becomes, how will we prepare ourselves for this meeting with Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, يَا بَنِي آدَمَ خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدٍ Oh son of Adam, take your beauty, take your good clothes when you go to the masjid, when you go to the place of prayer. So when you stand before Allah, brothers and sisters, don't come on your PJs, man. People come to Fajr in the masjid in their pajamas. You're gonna stand before, Allah's gonna look at you and you're gonna come in your pajamas. If, you, if I told you you're going to stand before your boss, forget the king or the president or, or the greatest person on this earth, your boss at work, would you show up with your hair disheveled and, and you know, your sleepy eyes and you're coming in with your Pokemon pajamas? Hey, we had a meeting today. People are not just federal, some guys, especially summer vacation now, people wake up at Dhuhr time so they come to the mission or they pray at home in their pajamas at Dhuhr time. I mean, really? You're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the king of all kings, and you're going to come stand before him like this? Take your good clothes when you go to the place of prayer. So you stand before Allah with, with this, with a reverence for Allah. You recognize who you're standing before, so you get ready for the occasion. And we'll take a break after I read to you this article. This article, it's on this website by the way called igotitcovered.org. It's this website, I think actually some sisters in, near where I live in Michigan and in, in Windsor, they started this website, it's called igotitcovered.org. It's a website dedicated for sisters to support them for hijab. So I really recommend for the sisters, check it out. It's a very good website. igotitcovered.org. And for the brothers too, I, I read it a lot. You know why? Because when you're dealing with, imagine if you have daughters or your wives or your sisters or your friends, not your, not your friends, but your, your, your cousins and whatnot. <laughs> You need to also learn how to teach them to wear hijab and the value of hijab. And you know, the, the scholars say the hijab is like the flag of Islam. You are the flag bearers of Islam, sisters. And the brothers, a lot of times we have it easy because the sisters are recognized whenever they go. People recognize you as a Muslim. The, brother, the brothers, sometimes they can mix in. So we actually have to take it upon ourselves, brothers, to, to really to, to try and you know, support our sisters as much as possible. So this article was on there and somebody had posted on Facebook and I saw it. And it's a really, a, mashallah, very... Powerful article, so I want to share it with you. It's actually, we're talking, the theme of the conference is getting ready for Ramadan, right? So this actually article is about Ramadan, specifically. So let me read it to you. The title is, I wore my best hijab today. I wore my best hijab last night. A beautiful, shiny hijab. With bright embroidery and sweet sequins. I never wear bright scarves when I go out. I actually try for dull matte colors, usually black, if I'm being completely honest. To match the black abayas that I wear. 
I don't want to look bad when I go out, but I don't want to look particularly attractive or decorated when I'm outside my home either. I do it because of this ayah, in the ayah in Surah An-Nur, where Allah SWT says, And tell the believing woman to lower their gaze and guard their private parts and not expose their adornment, except that which necessarily appears. I mean, the face and the hands. So hijab, by the way, is not just, you know, wear a hijab and tight clothes. That's not hijab. Hijab is that you cover your hair and you cover your body. Loose clothing all the way through. So you wear this jilbab or abaya or something to, to cover the body so it's covered. Subhanallah, we see sisters now. Just like salah has become mechanical, hijab has become mechanical. That is just, I wear it, but I don't know what it means. I don't understand the modesty behind it. I don't understand why I'm doing it. People say I'm modest in my heart, so don't tell me to wear hijab. Just like people say, and the equivalent of it is, well, I worship Allah in my heart, so I have to pray salah. Right? I don't have to worship Allah. I mean, I, I, I worship Allah in my heart. No, you have to do what Allah says to do. That's a given. You have to answer the call of Allah. So she says, I'm content and comfortable with the way I dress, happy even, but wearing black can be hard for just one reason. There are so many beautiful hijabs out there. I see them, I want them, and sometimes I buy them. I know I'll never wear them outside, but they're so, so beautiful. And I tell myself, maybe on Eid, I'll make an exception. Or maybe I'll wear it as an accessory at home. And I buy them. I store them in my closet, sometimes thinking of ways and times to wear them often feeling guilty for owning things I don't need and don't use. And always, when I see them, thinking how beautiful they are. But last night was different. Last night I couldn't resist. And I tingled with excitement as I felt the strongest urge to dress up. I showered, I wore my best hijab, a light blue shiny hijab with gold and copper tone embroidery and delicate, delicate sparkling sequins. I wore my best abaya too, a long flowing gown I say for the best occasions. I spray perfume over myself and everywhere, a light clean scent that's one of my favorites. Normally I would die before I went out, went out dressed this way. I've never left my home all perfumed up and I pray that I never do. But last night was different. Last night I didn't go out. Last night after I had cleaned and dressed, adorned and perfumed myself, I laid out my prayer rug and I prepared to meet Al-Malik, the king. I learned this from our, our role models before us. When the last 10 nights of Ramadan would arrive, the righteous from our predecessors would get ready. They would prepare for the last 10 nights of Ramadan and for Laylatul Qadr and get ready to greet them like they would greet Eid. They would work hard in cleaning themselves, in, cleaning themselves both inside and out. According to Ibn Jarir, they used to refer, prefer to make ghusl every night of the last 10 nights. And in Nakha'i used to make ghusl every night of the last 10 nights. Some of them would make ghusl and get perfumed on the nights when it was most hoped to be Laylatul Qadr. Then she goes on to, I'm skipping some things, she says, Tamim al-Dari anhu had a garment he had bought for 1,000 dirham, which he would only wear on the night when he hoped would be Laylatul Qadr. And Thabit, Ibn Banani, Thabit al-Banani and Hamid al-Tawil would wear their best clothes and get perfumed and would perfume the masjid with the best perfumes on the nights they hoped would be Laylatul Qadr. It was all part of the preparation. The last 10 nights are here and it's time for every sister to pull out her prettiest hijab, her prettiest abaya, her sweetest perfume and the best phrases of dua. It's time to meet Allah in prayer at the best time of the year to greet the best of seasons and the best of nights. So long as we're at home, there is every reason to make a party of our clothes. And if we are going to the masajid, then we can still do our best while avoiding anything haram. It's time to bring our cleanest and best on the outside and work hard on bringing the cleanest on the best on the inside too. This is the idea we're talking about. You're getting ready to stand before Al-Malik, the king of all kings. So when you stand before Allah, yani wear some musk, wear some atr, you know, wear good clothes. Don't come like looking like a scrub. Wear nice and, and dress up and, you know, clean, brush your teeth. Prophet was sunnah that you would use a miswak or brush your teeth. Smell good. And just before we take a break, just a qu couple quick points. The ulama, they say it's makruh, it's disliked, that when you pray, for example, if you come to prayer and your sleeves are rolled up like this, don't start prayer like this. When you stand before Allah, stand with humility, roll down your sleeves. I say, well, is that really being arrogant? It's a sign of arrogance, and maybe people don't do it because of arrogance, but still, it's to humble yourself completely, what's better is you lower your sleeves. If you're wearing a, 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 a dress shirt, 
Some people, you know, they keep their shirt open, and it's, again, it's, it could be a form of arrogance. Not humble yourself. Button up your shirt properly. Don't leave it open. Don't stand open like this. Stand before Allah humble. And come to salah, yani, dress properly. And make sure your awrah is covered at a minimum. Especially, brothers, sometimes people wear short t-shirts. So when they go into sujood, they, we see things we don't need to see, man. We don't need to see that. And it messes up your salah. Your awrah is uncovered. So wear something that covers you properly. Especially guys, we're talking about hijab for sisters, but the men, they, there's a, there's this, especially guys who are buff, they try to you know, like show their stuff. And that, we're modest, man. Be modest. They wear the muscle shirts that are short and small, so they can, you can show off your biceps and your chest and stuff. But like, when you go into the and whatnot, you're, you're showing yourself that you shouldn't be showing. And aslan, you should be modest just like our sisters are modest. Haya is not just for sisters. Prophet said that the Iman uh, bid'u wa sittuna shu'bah that Iman has more than 60 something branches, but he singled out Haya and he said, Haya u shu'bah tum min al Iman. And modesty and chastity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a part of Iman. In fact, he says every religion has a known characteristic by which it is defined, and the defining characteristic of Islam is Haya, is modesty. And to give you an idea, and I'll end with this. You know when we talked about Amr al Khattab yesterday in the khutbah? You guys were here in the khutbah? You know when he, they realized he was going to die? You know what he did? He sent his son Abdullah to Aisha, the mother of the believers. And he said, go to Aisha and send, send her salam, not from Amir al-Mu'mineen, but from Umar ibn al-Khattab. Don't send salam from the leader of the believers. Send salam from Umar, because I am no longer the leader of the believers. And ask her, Umar would like to be buried next to his two companions, his, Aisha's father Abu Bakr and her husband the Prophet they were both buried in the room of Aisha so he says Look, I want to be buried next to them my companions so Abdullah comes to Aisha and Aisha he finds her crying because Umar is about to die she's so sad so he waits for her and when she calms down a little she says he says Amir Mu'mineen na Amir Mu'mineen Amr al-Khattab send salam and he asks that he can be buried next to his two companions you know what Aisha says she says, I was holding this spot for myself. To be buried next to my father, the greatest man after Prophet Abu Bakr, and to be buried next to my husband, the greatest man, period, Muhammad Wasallam. But today she says, I will give preference to Umar over myself. This is our mother, Aisha. Our role models from the men and for the women. This is our role model. You know, Amr al-Khattab, when his son comes back, he says, he was lying, remember he was lying down because his injury was so bad? He says, sit me up. I want to get the news and I'm ready for it. What? He says, this is the most important thing to me after salah and after the khilaf of the Muslims, this is the most important thing to me personally. So Abdullah says, good news, oh my father. Aisha has agreed. Then you know what Amr al-Khattab, he says, and this is for the brothers, look at how men should treat their women. Not just their wives and sisters, but sisters in Islam. This is how the honor we treat our sisters with. He says, after I die, after I die and I pass away, take my body to her outside her, her house, her room. And again, send salam, not from Amir al-Mu'mineen, but from Umar. And again, ask for permission that I be buried next to my two companions. And if she says no, then take me to the graveyard of the Muslims. Why did he do that? Because he knew she was emotional, maybe she felt bad for Umar, that she would just agree to, to let him be buried there. So after he dies, ask, ask her again. This is subhanAllah. And he did that, and Aisha gave him permission. But you know what Aisha says, this is what I mean by modesty. Brothers and sisters, Aisha is our mother. Umma Ummul Mu'mineen. She's our mother, we learn from her, we want to be like her. She says, after Umar was buried there in my room, Abu Bakr is her mahram, is her father. Muhammad is her, is her husband, her mahram. But she says, when Umar was buried in my room, he's dead and he's six feet underground. She says, I could never enter my room again without hijab, without jilbab, without being fully covered up in my own, my own home, my own room. What, because a man who is ghayr or mahram is in the room, even though he's dead and buried six feet under. So sisters, now when you go out in the, how can you, how, when this is the example, our mother, your mother left, how can you go out in the public and show your beauty to the people that Allah has given you as a blessing? How can you use that blessing to sin against Allah? This is how 
much Aisha held on to Haya. This is the defining characteristic of a believer, brothers and sisters, is Haya, is modesty. And it's not just for sisters, it's for the men as well. And if we are modest, our sisters will reflect that. But men have become so, so bold in the way they talk, and the way they act, and the way they dress. It reflects on our sisters as well. So inshallah ta'ala, when we stand before Allah, we stand with humility and modesty, and we worship Allah in a way that we ask Allah is befitting of Him.